in and say radical things. Um, it's called, it's nicely titled, Herbal Support for Gardeners During Tick Season. <laughs> <laughs> Only to say that um, the FDA silences herbalists a lot right now, so I tried to write something that could be a benefit to you all. So you should go ahead and pass it around if you want one. And we can talk about ticks later if you want to. <laughs> also, sign up for our email newsletter. Is everybody comfortable and okay? I know we were thinking we were going to make a circle, but they said we wouldn't all get in here if we were going to make a circle. <laughs> so, oh, well, I know you can keep talking. Um, I just wanted to start with some shopkeeping stuff, and then I'm going to introduce you. So, first, welcome everyone, um, and thank you so much for joining us in the second part of our Monday night meeting summer speaker series. Um, this is a tradition that Helen and Scott started, and we've been keeping it going and inviting some fabulous guests. There's a schedule on the, the kitchen table in there that you can take home with you um, and make sure to check out some of the other presenters that are coming up. Also, um, make sure to stick around afterwards and engage with each other. That's part of what this is about. There's hot corn, tea, some herb water in the kitchen. Um, and sign the guest book on the table if you'd like. There's also a donation basket there. If you want to keep the great work going here, we, we do rely on individual donations. Um, and when you sign the guest book, you can leave your email address if you'd like to be on the mailing list for the Good Life Center. So next week, Sally Clinton will be presenting on <coughs> seasonal eating and Ayurvedic perspectives. Um, and then on the 24th of July, which is a Sunday, we're also participating in Open Farm Day, which has a full lineup of different speakers, including um, Naturally Bug-Free with Stephanie Torles. Um, and Bob Jones, who's here tonight, is going to be doing some proper use of garden tools. I'm going to demo making sauerkraut. Greg is going to do some compost building. And another Greg Jolie is going to work on stone doing some stone walls, hearing style, a, a discussion of that. Um, and then the last piece of housekeeping is that the Good Life Center has started, is in the works of starting a YouTube channel. And you can see our lovely cameraman in the corner here. Some of these, so we're uh, working on some new stuff to put on the YouTube channel and then also doing some archiving of old footage to get up on there. So um, without Further ado, tonight's main attraction and our special guest, Deb, um, is an herbalist, gardener, teacher, and author of two books, one of which she has on the table for sale here, How to Move Like a Gardener. She is the founder of Avena Botanicals in Rockport, Maine, um, which is beautiful and open to, to garden tours Monday through Friday. Maybe it's 12 to 5. 12 to 5 with um, guided tours on Wednesdays. So you can check online for a full schedule of that, but I highly recommend it. So I just wanted to say um, a little bit of, just before I begin, that it's lovely to be back here, so I really want to thank you for keeping this going. And I met, I first met Scott and Helen in 1978 when I was a student at College of the Atlantic. And I was thinking, it was so fun to see this because this is what they did. They came to Public Atlantic and they showed this film. And so that was my first introduction as a young college student to meeting them. And then it was in the late 80s, I think maybe 87 or 88, somebody called me. Helen needed some herbal medicine. And I remember it was like in November. And I just remember I had to drive up here and just was really happy. I sat in this room with her. We talked for a long time about her. And things that she needed and just my memory of, of her I, I knew her of course until she passed away and so I spent a lot of time with her as some so many of you actually had to spend time with her. Some of you was um, but I wanted to say that I really put up what I appreciated about Helen and I think it's I think for so many of us we might have been fortunate um, to for young people to to be recognized by older people. Um, we have a seed that we're planting and we have a vision to carry. And so that was certainly true for me as a young 25, 26 year old who had a vision of wanting to 
contribute to the planet in a good way through the use of these plants. And I already had started, to, I've been gardening since I was 16, and I was given my first herb book, which was written by somebody, um, Alan and Swab, Julia Berkeley Levy, who um, was an herbalist born in England. And there's a beautiful document about her life called Julia of the Herbs, which you can find. It's available online, and I'm sure it's, it's you can download it online. There's some beautiful footage of Scott, of, of Helen and Julia in this room, actually. And Scott and Helen and Julia had met each other in the late 40s at a health ranch in Mexico. And so here are three really unique individuals who I'm sure far and few in between were like-minded. And so Helen and Julia corresponded from the late 40s until I brought her here in 1990. And that's actually an Elliot Julia also. So it was amazing when I thought about like no internet, nothing. We just had this they had this correspondence all these years and then it was really very special to see these two wise women get to meet each other and get to talk. And so you see some of that in the documentary with Julia the Herbs and um, they just kept that correspondence going all those years. So those are a couple of fond memories I have of, of Helen and Julia. And just to say Julia wrote many, many of her books. There's probably a few in this library that she wrote. Common Herbs for Natural Health was like a real classic one that she wrote. That was the book that was given to me when I was 16 years old. So for over 40 years, I've been, shall we say, just in love with medicinal plants. And as a young woman, as I said, with Helen, recognizing my, just my deep dedication and commitment to wanting to bring forth something to be a benefit to, to people on the planet. So, I will tell you one story too. I remember when I first started to grow vegetables when I was 16, there was an elder man down the road from where I grew up in a little town called South Paris in Western Maine. And I remember um, I knew nothing about gardening. This is over 40 years ago. And the word organic gardening, gardening really wasn't a word much in Maine. I mean, Mokka was just kind of beginning, but I didn't even know about Mokka. But I do remember this experience so clearly of planting tomatoes and eggplants, and I was so proud of these plants I was growing. And um, Frank was his name. He was using some kind of pesticide in his garden, and I didn't even, I hadn't even heard the term pesticide, but uh, what I remember so strongly was this incredible burning sensation in my nose and this horrible taste in my mouth. And then about a year later, somebody sent me a little organic gardening magazine, so that was my introduction to recognizing that there are Please come in. There are harmful things in the environment, and they still are. There still are, and that there's also organic gardening. So, beautiful memory I have. And then it was at that same year that I was giving some days. So, the topic tonight is um, on. I'm going to talk about four favorite herbs that are that are really supportive to the immune system. And I, when Laura actually called and asked if I would come. We could spend days and days and days talking about different medicinal plants and talking about how to grow them and how to harvest them and how to prepare them. But I thought I would talk about two very common ones that probably many people in this room are growing. Echinacea, people growing echinacea, people growing echinacea, and also the elderberry. Probably some people growing elderberry. So we'll talk about those two. And then I wanted to talk about two Chinese medicinals that grow really, really, really well here in Maine. One is astragalus root, and one is shazamia berry. And they're both very, very favorite plants of mine. Actually, all four of them I love very much. So we'll talk about each of them in different ways. But it's it's such an interesting time just to say to me as a herbalist right now, and I'm sure if Juliet was alive, she'd be shaking her head just like some of us in this room are. And so just to say that one of my hopes of this evening and one of my hopes with um, just the inspiration to inspire others to plant a few medicinal plants in their garden and to learn a little bit about how to use them is to remember that medicinal plants are the oldest form of medicine on our planet. There's nothing new about what we're talking about. And that people around the world still rely on medicinal plants as a primary source of medicine. In this country, you know, there's such a long history and the genocide of Native Americans and the loss of incredible plant knowledge through, through the genocide. 
and then obviously lots of European settlers brought with them seeds hidden, sown in the skirts of their, you know, the hems of their skirts. So it's kind of become a melting pot of medicinal plants in this country. Um, there still are a few people that know something about Christian traditional uses, and there's really, Julia is really kind of the one who kind of brought the herbal, the herbal renaissance, I would say, back into being possible in this country for people to be learning about and attending gardens and being inspired to make different choices. And Elliot and I were visiting a little bit before I came here, and there's so much that I could say about what's happening that makes it difficult for herbalists and for um, just people who want to grow and learn to use medicinal plants. So it's important that we gather and inspire one another because herbal medicine, I say, is really the medicine of the people. And still the World Health Organization today says that 80% of people worldwide rely on herbs as their primary source of medicine. So in this country, you know, the herbal the movement towards herbs has become an industry. It's so important that we recognize that that industry has really has a potential of really taking away from all of us the freedom to use medicinal plants. So you can say that in this room. <laughs> so it's important that we all, in some way, even if it's one or two herbs that you might be excited about learning, that you um, own them or support your neighbor growing them and that you remember that it is our right to be able to learn about the uses of these plants. It's our right to have any choices to use medicinal plants, even though right now um, the FDA has silenced herbalists. We are unable to write about and, and unable to really educate people about the uses of medicinal plants. Like just for example, for us on our website, we had to take down everything that we said about the uses of plants. So if you go to Adina's website right now, it's very standard what we can say. There's a there's an appropriate legal language that herbalists can use in our written material. So it's why it's ever more important that we all um, come together and learn from each other and, and teach our neighbors and our friends and the next generation so that we don't lose it's a right to be able to so, Yeah, we know we shut ourselves we, we stopped production for seven months because this just past winter Back in production and um, trying to fight really hard for the rights of small people to stay in production and teach our neighbors how to use this. So that's, we can talk about that later. So I love that um, Richard Chud Robert Chutkin was here, and I love that he gave me the part of um, Wendell Bear, who is a great fan of mine. And I just want to say thank you to you for helping Americans with all the truth. So let's start with um, Echinacea. So Echinacea is a beautiful plant to start with. I say it's a bridge herb because so many people grow it in their gardens, not because they know it has medicine use, but because it's a beautiful, beautiful plant. And um, we can look at a photograph of it. I want to say we have nine species. There's nine species of Echinacea native to the prairie in this country. And we also know that there's a lot of loss of prairie going on in this country, too. So it's important that I think that we grow echinacea both because it's so beautiful, it's a hardy perennial here. There's one photograph of it. The beautiful, 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 beautiful flowers. The monarch butterfly that photo many, many years ago. Um, there they are in the front too. The little book that we put together. Echinacea. So the echinacea purpurea is the species that's the easiest to grow here in Maine. There's another one. For the warblers, the warblers love echinacea. It's so beautiful. Um, it's very easy to start from the seed. And so I said I would talk a little bit about just growing and about harvesting and about using this plant. So echinacea, um, the seed actually is, is quite a good sized seed. Very, very easy to start. The echinacea purpurea is the easiest to start from the seed. And we just take 50 plug trays in our hoop house at the end of March and we just sow you know, two or three seeds per plug. And we put out about 750 echinacea seedlings um, every summer. And what will happen is your young ones will grow. If you start them even earlier, you'll get flowers the first year. But generally, you get flowers the second year. And so what we do is we let the, let the first year ones grow. And in the second year plants, we start to harvest the fresh flowering tops and the leaves. And if you've ever nibbled on the echinacea leaves, anybody ever nibbled on them? The whole mouth will tingle. 
And the tingling sensation in echinacea is the real key to knowing that you have really, really good quality echinacea. So if you're somebody buying an echinacea tincture, and I forgot to bring you but that's your mouth wants to tingle. That's the, in, that's the signature of really good quality echinacea. So all parts of echinacea can be used. So you can you can um, tincture fresh in alcohol water base. That's what a tincture is. You can tincture your echinacea leaves fresh. I tincture my whole flowers. And that was something I was inspired. Probably in the 80s, I saw this incredible photograph from China. And it was tall milk thistle flowers. This beautiful, beautiful two-gallon glass jar of tincture. Because obviously in China, they make lots of medicine too. And I thought, why would I ever want to grind up echinacea flowers? They're mm -hmm. so beautiful. So we make beautiful gallon jars of just whole echinacea flowers and that, that we teach them. And the same, we talk about our echinacea leaves. And then your echinacea plant wants to be three years old before you dig the root. But what's wonderful about echinacea, so generous of a plant. So these seeds will scatter. And this is why I always say it's important as a gardener, as a herbalist, to know what the little tiny seedlings of all the plants look like that we see. So echinacea will be very generous in how it receives if you're if you don't mulch so much with straw and things like that, you can't necessarily see them. So the scattered seeds, you can collect your seeds. I will say that um, probably about 18 years ago I had collected echinacea seeds for actually for many years, probably for like maybe eight or nine years. And it was about 18 years ago I had this experience where I was collecting the seeds, and then I started to plant them the following March, and I had no germination. Mm. And so this is a story of what took me to begin to study and work with pollinators, because I was shocked. And then I realized as a gardener, like how little actually I really understood the whole pollination process. So I thank Echinacea, because Echinacea flower attracts all kinds of different kinds of butterflies and a number of our native bees, and the honeybee. So it's a really important flower for attracting a range, a range of pollinators. And for some reason, that particular year, it was not good pollination. And so that's when I began to really just explore you know, what really is pollination about and what really is important about bringing pollinators. And one of the things I can say that I've been observing the diversity in our gardens and our farms. So we want a diversity of flowering plants throughout the growing season. And most of our pollinators as farmers are generalists, whereas if you go right to the tropics, this is why we're beginning to lose tropical species, because if they lose their individual pollinator, you use your plot, your plant, or if you lose your plant, you lose your pollinator. So for us here, our pollinators are generalists. So the echinacea is has a lot of different pollinators, and for whatever reason that year, I didn't have a very, very poor pollination of seeds, but it was an opportunity to know. So that's just a little bit about paying attention to the flowers. So if you're somebody who wants to, as I said, make some echinacea tincture medicine, gather your leaves, gather your flowers, and then let your plants grow for three years. And in the fall of the third year, after your seeds have scattered, you can go and dig those roots. And so that's a little bit about the, um, the growing and the harvesting. It needs to grow. Echinacea is a prairie plant, so obviously you want to create an environment that doesn't like really, really rich soil. It doesn't want wet soil. It wants full sun. And we do mulch our echinacea with just with snow. So, um, and the other thing about echinacea, it loves to grow in community. If you look at it in the photographs of in the prairie, you'll see that it's not like one echinacea plant here or one here. They love to grow in community. That's another thing that I've been observing a lot about certain plants. And so watching them in the wild in their native habitat will give you lots of information about growing them. So grow them in community. Don't grow just one. Grow like 10 or 20 or 30 or 100 or 500. <laughs> so echinacea, how many people use echinacea? Use echinacea. Um, so we think of echinacea, and if you know, sort of, that's something I wanted to remember to tell you earlier. Um, echinacea is, really became um, known for its ability to kind of quickly mobilize the immune system, particularly the white blood cells. So when the body is exposed to 
early on some kind of a flu virus or even a bacteria, some kind of a pathogen, even mosquito bites. And so I learned when Julia came to visit me in 1990, she had never had a mosquito bite. She grew up in Europe and had been in Europe. She had such huge welts. Anybody have welts for mosquito bites? It's like they know who to nibble on if you're a foreigner from someplace else. And I gave her echinacea, and I do, I give echinacea to her to a lot of people who have different types of bug bites and insect bites and swell, because it's the body is reacting to a foreign pathogen that's come into the body. So echinacea is really brilliant in that way, but being able to quickly start taking it, quickly mobilize the white blood cells so that the immune system, which is wise in the body, begins to respond and it will lessen the reaction that the body is having and it will take down eventually the swelling. It's why also now at this deep time, so many people are using echinacea as one of the herbs that they're using if they get bitten by a tick. Again, a tick is a you know, it's, it's, it's a foreign invader. And when, it, when you get bitten, then uh, the spider keeps enter the body. So echinacea can be always used for any kind of tick bite. And it's also why anybody who's bitten by a tick, I take echinacea tincture and I'll put it on a band-aid and put it right on the place where someone's been bitten. And I say, change that band-aid a couple times a day. So you get the echinacea tincture on that band-aid and do that. So that's a couple things just about bug bites and insect bites. And um, traditionally, the Native people were very, very generous in teaching the settlers who went west into the prairie about echinacea. And it was used very commonly for snake bites. Mm -hmm. So that's something if anybody also, any kind of reactivity the body reacts to different types of bites. Echinacea is really important. Right? Mm -hmm. But we think of it as using it at the onset of colds and flus and fevers. That's really how echinacea kind of has gotten its reputation. So since I, I'm talking about some of the herbs that enhance immunity, echinacea is obviously, I say it's one of the first herbs that probably a lot of people who have actually never taken herbs, learn about echinacea. That's when I say it's a bridger. Because oftentimes there are many, many people that they've not had the opportunity to be around people who use herbs or grow herbs or grow up with using herbs. It's so beautiful now to watch a lot of young people in the next wave of herbalists are growing up with herbs. It's just in their life. But if that's unfamiliar, because there's so much publicity about echinacea, Oftentimes, the first bird that somebody has an experience with. <coughs> so, the way that it's most effective for the onset of a cold, a flu, a fever is you have to use you have to use it in, um, often. So, acute dosing. When I when I dose somebody <coughs> for really trying to have the immune system have a very quick response in the body, you want to dose somebody either every 30 minutes to every two hours. So with echinacea, somebody starts to feel like coming out with a sore throat, swollen glands, an ear infection, tonsillitis, laryngitis, those type of symptoms. You would give somebody or yourself take echinacea every like one to two hours until those symptoms, we all know what it feels like, a common cold, flu fever, you just start to feel, oh, I don't feel well. You want to take it every couple hours to quickly activate the immune system. So that's kind of when it's being used for acute type of symptoms. And then you see that um, there seems to be really differing information about echinacea as far as using it long term. And from what I understand, there was a mistranslation in a lot of German, there was there's been a lot of research in echinacea in Germany, interesting enough. Mm -hmm. A lot of sort of scientific research on medicinal <coughs> plants that we use a lot of happens in Germany. And a lot of German physicians actually use these medicinal plants. And I'll, I'll differentiate what I mean by that. But the echinacea apparently, it can be used over a period of time, but a lot of times people just utilize it because they think it'll keep, keep you well. And that's not actually the way to really use echinacea. Echinacea really is useful to mobilize the immune system, and it can be used over a period of time in combination with other herbs and not necessarily by itself for long term. You will see, there's a wonderful herbalist named Matthew Wood, who wrote the book called The Book of Herbal Wisdom, and he calls echinacea the farmer's herb. Mm -hmm. And he says, for all the farmers working so hard in the summertime, it's not the first herb that I would use, but he said oftentimes in the Midwest, the farmers would use echinacea. You know, we all have to stay well when we're farming. Farming season can be so short and so intense and so physically demanding that 
that a lot of farmers were using a little bit, you know, maybe once a day or a few times a week just to kind of give a little bit of extra support to the immune system. I will, there's a couple other herbs that I use, I tend to use more, so a combination that way. That is another way to consider it. And um, I also wanted to say that I use it, um, I'll use it for a lot of lymphatic congestion. And so I'll use it both internally, so swollen glands, another sign of another sign that the immune system is reacting. So it's not the only one that we can use for swollen glands, but if you start to feel like that's oftentimes the sign of the first result, like you feel oh, a little bit tender here, a little bit tender under the armpits. Think about using echinacea. And so um, when I say about acute dosing, you want to really dose, you know, as I said, every few hours. When you start to feel the swollen glands or the sense of a fever or cold resolving, then you would use echinacea like three times a day for another 10 to 14 days. So you feel like the immune system has really been activated. It's really ensuring those symptoms have, have, have resolved. Does that make sense mm -hmm. in, in that way? I think a lot of people think that, oh, well, I'll just use an herb once or twice or you know, not very much. And people sometimes misunderstand that in Acute stage when we illness, we have to really dose ourselves enough and often enough. Um, but I want to I want to back up and say about how I think about herbs. So we've kind of talked about echinacea, and it's used both for acute situations, and it can be used sometimes long term for other things like if someone's traveling. Sometimes we put echinacea in a formula for somebody. Um, I might use it for somebody who's in doing. Like somebody who maybe is caregiving, like the end of a, like their parents at the end of their life or something, and they're in a, in a kind of in a tough situation, I might add information to a formula with other things to support them in that kind of intense environment where they need to stay really well. Um, I often will use echinacea with elderberry, which I'll talk about when we talk about elderberry, particularly people working in school systems, in hospitals, nursing care facilities who are around them. Exposed to lots of different types of pathogens, but I love those two together, the elderberry and echinacea. But there's four ways that I think about using herbs. And the first one I'm going to talk about is, is to put it in a larger context, is that lots and lots and lots of people around the world use herbs in their daily life, in tea, and in cooking, and in just different foods. So like you know, there's so many fresh herbs that we could use echinacea. You could chop up a little bit of it and mix it into a salad and get a little tealiness. Mm -hmm. But there's so many properties in herbs that are very nourishing and nutritive. And that's something that I hope more and more people will begin to use herbs in daily in teas, which probably many of you do, but also in cooking. For example, nettles. How many people eat nettles? nettles? I, I hope that Again, like in Europe, we begin to see um, lots and lots of gardeners and even farmers kind of designating an area off to the side for nettles. And stinging nettles is one of the most nourishing nutritive herbs that we have because it's so high in bioavailable iron. So those of us, most of us love nettles. Um, so I'll give you an example of kind of a nutritive nourishing herb that also can be a tonic herb. Tonic herbs are ones that we use over a period of time, for a minimum of four to six weeks, two months, three months. A lot of times, tonic herbs we use through different seasons. We might do different herbs in the winter <coughs> versus different tonic herbs in the summer versus different tonic herbs like in the fall. But tonic herbs <coughs> really serve to strengthen and revitalize and enhance the function, the health and function of different organs, the organ systems, and tissues in the body. So nettle, as we said. It's very building, it has a lot of bioavailable iron, so it, it helps to really build blood, it builds energy to the body. Um, a lot of people will drink fresh nettle tea throughout the spring, even into the summer. A lot of people will cook with nettles, like nettle leaf potato soup is fabulous, um, things like that. So you're getting a lot of the nourishment from it. If you were to have somebody, and I'm just giving, I'm using nettles as an example, if you were to be somebody with hay fever symptoms, so oftentimes we say that nettles is really good to start a month before hay fever season, and that's when you use it as a tonic. 
So like in the springtime, we might be eating it and drinking tea and really benefiting from its nourishment. But for people who have hay fever symptoms, runny eyes and nose and coughing and things like that, if you start nettles a month before those, the season begins, nettles actually have the ability to strengthen the cell wall so that when the body is exposed to whatever the pathogens are, the body has less of a histamine reaction. So again, that's using it as a tonic. So you're using it consistently over, you know, maybe several months to really strengthen it in that way. So this is an example. So the third way that I think, so I think the nutritive nourishing herbs, the tonic herbs, which we're talking a little bit about tonight with the immune system. The third category of meaning of medicine plants that we use for very specific situations like ear infections, sinus infections, pneumonia, all kinds of illnesses that um, even people who are going through cancer treatment, you can, you, know, you can integrate herbs into somebody's um, protocol to help support the immune system. So the medicine plants, I say, echinacea is definitely a medicine plant, are ones that we use very thoughtfully for certain situations for certain lengths of time. Another one is golden seal. You know, a lot of people may have learned about golden seal. Very, very strong antibacterial herbs. Use it for a short period of time and we're done with using it. Um, comfrey is another one. Would you guys have comfrey growing here? Yeah. A lot of people have comfrey growing. Comfrey, I'll speak very frankly about comfrey. Comfrey, the FDA does not let us sell comfrey for internal use. Comfrey has been used for thousands of years by people around the world, and it is a remarkable herb, the root and the leaf. Very remarkable as a medicinal, as a medicinal plant, not a beverage tea. It's not something you can go, oh, let's drink a cup of comfort tea every day for months and months. It's a very medicinal herb for healing broken bones and any kind of musculoskeletal injury. So that's that's like that's a medicinal plant. You would use it for a very designated situation. And the, the way that you avoid the use of comfort is if you're pregnant, if you're nursing, if you have hepatitis, or cirrhosis of the liver. Comfrey, um, this is where we know, and I'll be very frank, that there's a lot of bad scientists out there making really bad statements about medicinal plants because they're not testing them appropriately. The use of, there's a pyrolyzidine alkaloid in comfrey. And if you feed rats mega, 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 mega doses of comfrey, of course they're going to have a liver toxicity. But when you're using comfrey as a medicinal herb a little bit at a time, it's going to be safe as long as those cautions that I gave you are okay. And when I broke my wrist a few minutes, out and put my wrist out and broke my wrist. You know, I, I used comfrey root as a tincture with Solomon seal root and teasel root and bone sac, and I feel beautifully. And there wasn't even any scarring in the last in the last extra we gave me. So that's just an example of when we use a medicinal plant for a certain amount of time in a certain situation. And just the last thing I want to say in honor of the healers around the world who also engage with using plants. Or either they burn them in ceremonies. There's a lot of herbs that are used in healing ceremonies too. And I've been fortunate to have some beautiful teachers that have um, really offered beautiful healing ceremonies with either the bathing of plants or the burning of herbs to clear of space, things like that. So there's there's so much more we could say about the uses of plants, but those are kind of more basic uh, the context in which to give you it. Then we have uh, our last question or comment about should we go on? Yes. Next question is probably a question for these different herbs, but I'm going to use kids. I feel ways to treat people better. Yeah. Not diminish the yeah. value of the kids. It's a great question about children. So let me just say a few things. Um, there are a few really nice tasting herbs if you're giving a child a tea. And so linden flowers are one of the sweetest tasting herbs that we have. To add into a tea, linden is very, it's a nerve, it's very calming, very relaxing to the body. So, I don't know, is, is anybody growing linden on this peninsula? Anybody have any linden trees? Right. Yeah, good. So, I hope that we see people planting more linden trees. Metco tree sells a linden. But it's, you can buy dried linden flower tea also. So, you want to think about mixing herbs in like a linden, like lemon balm. The other one that tastes really, really good is cat mint. Not cat nip. Cat nip is really bitter tasting. Cat mint. 
The leaf and the flower of the low growing top mint is also sweet tasting. So think about adding in a few. Let me just finish, and then I'll take your question. Think about adding in a few herbs like that for, for the children. There also are some herbs that you can actually um, make syrups with for children, like elderberry and elderflower make a really great tasting syrup. Um, lemon balm is also one you can add into a glycerin base. It would be really sweet. Echinacea root you can also add into a, into a glycerin base. If you're going to be making glycerin based tinctures, make sure that you're getting an organic glycerin because now um, glycerin is either comes from coconut or from beets. And most of our sugar beets now are GMO unless you have trust that you're buying, able you to buy certified organic um, beets. So buying certified organic glycerin is a safer way to be able to get glycerin. So not all herbs extract from glycerin. Many, many of our really aromatic herbs extract well of glycerin, like lavender, lemon balm, mint, catnip, anise. So they, they draw out, glycerin um, draws out those really aromatic products. So that will, that will also be helpful for a child. That, that means your question. It does. Also, just mm -hmm. administering a tincture, you have to buy a human tincture. Yeah. You know, so, sometimes you just can't find it, but the straight, uh, raw taste. Better to do it than not. So, and with children, we dose differently. With children, I say one drop of tincture for every five pounds of body weight. And that's kind of a way of dosing. So, you know, in a little bit of honey would be a great way to get into that. That's why syrups are really great. The other thing you can think about um, is one of my teachers loves to make lots of different fresh herbs in like organic water. If the child had a, um, a really bad cold, you might not want to give too much butter. But it's a great way, like fresh thyme and fresh sage and fresh rosemary, you know, making herbal butters would be a really nice, delicious way. Even to get just you know, the qualities of like all those culinary herbs that we think about, they all have medicinal value to them. I mean, we can sit here and talk all night long about sage and thyme and rosemary. They all have strong antimicrobial properties. And so when you think about just all of us staying well, include those in you know in your herbal butters or in your herbal vinegars. Another way to do it, you know, to make all these beautiful herbal vinegars that you're using in your salads or using in your cooking. And you know, you can make a really nice syrup from garlic and onions by just layering in chopped onions and garlic with either honey or just organic raw sugar. And the organic raw sugar will just draw out the juices. So again, those kinds of things need to become a base for when you're working with children and children. And for all of us. You know, a great garlic onion syrup is a great way to take things. And then pickling garlic is another way to get it itself. So, yeah. You had a question. And what would you say about taking a powder Yeah. Capsules as opposed to Yeah. It's a, it's a great question. I can say that I'm not a fan of capsules. And the, the reason that is is because, there's a few reasons. and But we can talk about when it's appropriate. So as soon as an herb is powdered, it begins to oxidize. I also don't trust most capsule companies that they're filling them with other things. Um, so you have to really read labels carefully and really trust who you're buying from. The other thing just to say about the quality of herbs, which is a massive problem in the industry, is that when you when you gather herbs, for all of us who are drying them, the ideal temperature to dry herbs is between 80 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Most herbs in the commercial market are dried in massive, massive ovens at really high temperatures. So you destroy most of the medicinal properties. So right there, you can't really trust what's happening as far as the quality and that kind of an industry that then those herbs are then being powdered and put into capsules. So you have to really trust that you're buying it from a company that's really paid attention to that. There is one documentary film out, and there's a second one that's going to be made. The first one is called Newman, N-U-M-E-N, -E made by a friend of mine who really looks at the herbal world. And she got a big, she got a, some grant money, and she's actually been filming in China and in India where lots and lots and lots of herbs are coming to this com company in the large industry and what's really happening in the quality and lack of quality. The problem a lot with China is 
heavy metal contamination. So they're supposedly supposed to be um, tested before they get they get made into these capsules and pills, but I I know too much about the FDA to, to know that I you know if it says you know certified CGMP, maybe you can trust that. I don't know. So you have to be thoughtful about it. Um, it's difficult because for some people they don't want to do an alcohol tincture. I totally understand that. That's for somebody who want to do an herbal tea. So again, you want to just be really careful about quality. Leaves and flowers that are dry, dried at a good temperature and stored in dark cupboards, cool places, out of the direct sunlight, will have a shelf life of one and you know one and a half years or so. So you want to again read labels. Your roots and your barks and your seeds will have a shelf life of two to three years. So this is also an issue of quality. <coughs> That's why it's so wonderful that we can get more people growing herbs and you know getting herbalists everywhere in communities so that people have access to better quality. Is there more potency in the roots? I mean, uh, Depends on what the plant is. Flowers. Not all like in echinacea, you know, you can use echinacea flower, leaf, and root. In in elderberry, which we're going to talk about, you can use the elder flower and the elderberry, but you don't use the roots. Poisonous. Um, yeah, elderberry, you can use the flower and the berry. That's what you use. And those, we'll, we'll talk about that next. They can be dry as well. But you did mention the parts of echinacea. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So all parts of the echinacea plant are useful, and they all have a little bit of a different kind of quality. So I actually like combining them together. There's something that gives a synergy about using echinacea root, echinacea leaf, and echinacea flower. We make our tinctures and then we combine them together. That's how we do that. And, um, but echinacea root can be made in the glycerin base. And you get some benefit from that. You may not want to use glycerin. So then you could use a really good quality echinacea, dried echinacea root tea. That's how you would do echinacea. Yeah. Ooh, I suppose you could try putting echinacea leaf and flower in the dark. Mm -hmm. I've never tried it, but um, I think the echinacea root tea is what you want. Yeah. So the elderberry, we'll, we'll talk about the elderberry. They're flowering right now. Has anybody been seeing them on the sides of the roads and things like that? Um, Juliet always said to me, be sure that when you're picking flowers, particularly the flowers, when you look at um, the flowers that are in the carrot family, like elderberries, they're the but they have a lot, a lot of little, lot of little tiny flowers, and so you want to, hopefully, if you can, pay attention to when the elders start to bloom, and you want to go to gather those flowers at the early onset of when they're blooming, because if you go at, towards the latter part, you're just going to fall apart on the beautiful elder flowers. So um, it's nice to have a sense of your neighborhood where they are, because obviously you want to pick away from the roadsides, and you want to pick away from power lines. There's a lot of spray in the power lines, and there's just a very strange energetic feel in the power lines. So they're very, very easy to grow. Is anybody growing? Anybody plant some elderberries? Beko tree sells lots of elderberries, different varieties. Um, the best way to do it is to get two different varieties because they need to cross pollinate with each other. You can also start cuttings in early in the spring and put them in rooting hormone, and they'll start to grow for you. And then. It takes three to four years before they're big enough to produce flowers and berries. So um, deer love them, so you need to protect them in some way from the deer. So either putting you know chicken wire of some kind around you know that spike you to protect the young ones as they grow up. Um, there's an incredible elder bush behind Tinder Heart Bakery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did yes. you plant that? I did. It's great. Oh mm -hmm. my god. Oh. Yeah. Hi. So fantastic. It's another tree, and I have taken cuttings, and I didn't need to do rooting hormone. But I just propagated from the root because it has the lateral. Ah, it's so very that's easy. You're, you're propagating in that yes. way. For people, I know just from the Petco folks when they take it, but they make a lot of times people will make a willow tea. Yeah, that that's way. true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That Barbara Damage taught me at that. So, but you're taking the runners. Yeah, propagating in that it's way. Very easy. Do you yeah. know what? You know what? What the variety of the trees that you have. The variety, um, it's definitely the canadensis, and I don't remember the variety. At the top of my head, maybe Adams, one of those. Did you guys ever cut it down? I had to cut it this year. Yeah, there was a lot of dieback. And what happened? It it's just regrowing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm curious. I'm asking people because I also saw the most magnificent 
elder tree, very much like yours that I saw. I was so impressed when I saw yours. Mm -hmm. um, that was at a Waldorf School of New Hampshire. It was huge. And somebody had mowed the whole thing down by the state. Yeah. 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 And I was just like, wow, this is incredible. So I really, I'm actually going to do an experiment in our little elder grove this year. Yeah. I'm going to. I'm actually going to cut some of the woody ones back and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. We have some that are like five, six, seven, eight, ten feet tall. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of curious yeah. to see how it grows. But it loves to suffer. Right. Way. So it's a really, it's a magnificent one. So, um, so elder flowers are really lovely to dry for tea. And I say that if you're going to dry them, um, you know, we just dry on, just we make wooden, we just make wooden frames and we dry on just, non-metal screening. You never want to dry your herbs on metal screening. And it's nice to dry them in a place where there's no direct sunlight, a little bit of air circulation, things like that. And I said the ideal temperature is 80 to 100, so you get to kind of work with what you have. You put a dehumidifier in our drying room, so to take, to take all that um, water out of the air that hinders the drying process. So the elderflowers um, is one of my favorite herbs for many different situations. Elderflower also can taste it as a tea. It's it's kind of it's a little bit sweet, but it doesn't have a lot of, it's not really a strong flavor, so you could also add that into a tea mixture. So there's a really traditional tea mixture for bringing down fevers, which is using the white yarrow and elderflowers, and I use catmint. I love catmint so much. And um, elder, yarrow, peppermint, and sometimes peppermint. Again, it is just depending on the taste and they want so peppermint and elderflower and catmint are cool into the body. So when you have a fever, what you're trying to do with the white yarrow, a hot cup of uh, that tea, the white yarrow is going to help keep the body to sweat. And that sweating process is going to lower the fever. So those four are really traditional herbs to be growing and drying and having a tea for bringing on a fever. But the white elder my experience is that I really like it for upper respiratory type conditions. So sinus infections, a lot of block eustachian too, the, the nose is really congested, you know, dripping into your neck and being a little dramatic, but we all know those types of upper respiratory types of conditions. So elderflower is so wonderful that way to have it as a tea, to have it as a, you can, have a, you can make a glycerin from elderflower, you can make a syrup from elderflower, and you can also make a tincture from elderflower. And the, um, so any of those type of symptoms, the elderflower is great. It's also very safe for her. So for babies and children and even elders, elderflower is a very, very safe for so It's fabulous for children who use the block of station, which I've used it a lot in that way. Also with like an onion poultice, especially like if there's ear congestion, and your station tubes are blocked, you can chop up an onion and just cook it in a little tiny bit of water and put it between some thin cloth and put it over the ear of the station tube and give a little bit of elderflower and that can help to kind of get that, that congestion, that blockage moving. And when the eustachian tube is blocked, you're going to want to really give that elderflower four, five, six months a day. Right? So elderflower, in my experience too, works more with the upper respiratory and more like a more of a surface type of cough, like somebody might be just coughing a little bit, but for deeper coughs, I use the elderberry. And the elderberry, um, what we know from, there was a woman in Israel who researched elderflower and elderberries for I think about eight years. And I always find this image very interesting. She said that when she looked under the microscope with the constituents in the elderberry, what she was observing was with the different flu viruses. And if you've ever looked under a microscope at viruses, which I didn't have yet, it'd be fun to. From what she described, they're like these little, little, tiny, um, almost like invisible little thorns. That's what viruses look like under a microscope. And what they do is they puncture the cell walls, and then they get in, and that's how flu viruses start to replicate in the body. So what she saw under the microscope is the, um, the elderberries actually were almost like gobbling up those little thorns. So they were basically disarming them. So when you are either exposed to somebody with a flu or you feel yourself coming down with a flu, this is when you really want to use elderberry as a syrup or an elixir. Like we make, I think I've got, I think you pass it around. 
got it out of very least. So, um, it's got a little bit of alcohol, if someone doesn't want the alcohol, but it's made with an organic blister and lots and lots of fresh elderberries. You can see how it's a beautiful purple one. So feel free, if you want to, you can just go around and just put a little bit and make a little piece. It's so yummy. So, you can spend a little bit to get that little plastic off it. Um, so the elderberry, think about it for preventing flus. If you're, as I said, if you're somebody who's in an environment where you're working around a lot of people that might be exposed to different types of viruses, you would be using it as a tonic through the cold flu seasons to help prevent getting a flu. If you start to feel yourself coming down with the flu, that's when you want to start using it every one or two hours to really mobilize the body's immune system to fight off that those viruses. And oftentimes, um, oftentimes, if somebody is really like the body just aches with the flu, I like to add bone set to that. And bone set is one of our native flowering plants. It's a lovely plant that grows easily in your garden, or you'll see it kind of along stream banks or sometimes along the edges of ponds. The bone set and elderberry are both so great because the bone set will take down the aches of the of the flu and the elderberry would really start to, as I said, help to disarm kind of the virus it's trying to replicate in the body. The elderberry also, in my experience, is helping the pox go deeper. So if, if it goes in deeper, I would use elderberry. And the other one that I really, really love with deeper pox is mullein flowers. Now we think mullein leaf is traditional use for pox, but I, I make a mullein flower elixir. Little tiny melon flowers, everybody knows the melon. Yeah, they're they're right running now. out right now. It's they're beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, right. There's one right out here. Good. And so, what we do, we're just going to start tomorrow, actually, at Avina. I go out early in the morning and tie a little berry box, which you did with me, and braid it around my neck. And we just we pick the melon flowers early in the morning before um, they get too hot because every day new ones come out. <coughs> so, you want to go out in the morning and collect them while they're still really fresh. And I do a few things. One is I put them in olive oil for earaches. The second one is I put them in a glycerin alcohol base to make an elixir. And the almond flower elixir and the elderberry elixir I have found to be so, so beneficial when there's deep, deep congestion. It would really help to break that up. And if you think about where the mullein grows, sometimes in the forest, of soil, hard packed areas, you know, I always say, look to see where they grow and, and then maybe a little indication of how it helps in the body. I will just say one story about the FDA. So, most of you know about Coltswood? Coltswood has been used traditionally both, um, you know, for a long, long, long time as a very strong expectorant. And uh, mullein is an expectorant, helping when there's a lot of excess phlegm in the lungs to expel that excess, to expel the phlegm. And um, Coltswood, I used it for 30 years as a tincture. And I've dried plenty of it for a tea. And, and um, Coltswood is now, like Humphrey, on the FDA's hit list. So just to say, to give you this picture, when they were when they were here a year ago, they we had to pour our Coltswood tincture down the drain in front of them. That's what they're up to right now. Oh my God! So it's important that you be aware of that kind of behavior. Coltswood, Coltswood has a pyrolyzing alcohol, as does Humphrey. So again. We all have to educate ourselves about the uses of these plants and the wise use of them. Most what you wouldn't be drinking a beverage tea like you would for free either. You'd be using it if you have a really tough cough and you need to you need some help in expectorating that cough. So it's um yeah, so this is why we just have to keep on telling each other and I would say you all need to keep on drawing coats with tea for yourselves. As long as you're not pregnant, nursing or have hepatitis or cirrhosis a little bit. A little bit of it can be helpful in that way. It's really so helpful. So the other thing I want to say um, to say about the um, elder berries. Oh yes, I wanted to say about um, for people again. I think I said, but I'll say it again. Who have since we're talking about upper respiratory kind of congestion. Again, with the hay fever type symptoms, I always add elderflower into a formula because when there's when you're 
when that congestion starts to happen, even when the skin starts to get really itchy. And when some people have an allergic reaction, there's all those types of the bodies reacting, but also it can be a reaction to the skin. Elderflower is incredible. For when there's an allergic reaction and they start to get red, irritated, itchiness of the skin, or if somebody just touches something and you're allergic to it, and you get red, irritated, itchy skin. The other thing is I use a lot of elderflower as a cream for people with eczema. And that again is an issue. It's a top. It's very very healthy. <coughs> Topical use. People with eczema. It's a whole picture of how it helps somebody with certain forms internally. But topically, elderflower in a cream base can be very very cooling and very helpful and easing and lessening that kind of red irritation and flame reaction. Juliet always said to me. She said she would take elderflowers and wash her face with the elderflower tea. She said it always made you have less wrinkles. <laughs> she loved other flower. And um, it's a beautiful image of her. Just Sometimes she said she would just take the elder flowers and just wipe her whole face with the dew of the elder flowers. It's such a beautiful image. And then she would do the other flowers. So the other thing about the elderberries, the purple color. Does anybody know what elderberries look like? I think I have an image in here. Us picking the elderberries. There they are. Beautiful, beautiful deep purple. And the elderberries, and you just take clippers and when they get ready. How many those of you who who use elderberries know that the birds <coughs> love the elderberries? So you have to be working with the birds. Um, and of course, so some people will put netting over them because you're really wanting the elderberries when they're that purple. You don't want to get them when they're not ripe. And I and I said this today earlier that. There's also a red elder, and the red elder is red right now. So people who are new to elders need to know that the red elder blooms in May, not in late June, early July. And the red elder has red berries right now, whereas our white elder will have purple berries starting late August, early September. So again, it's good to differentiate about these two particular very different plants. The red elder is toxic. The white elder is so, so that purple color that's in the in the um, in the elderberries also is very high in a particular constituent proanthocyanidins, which is also present in blueberries and black raspberries and um, black currants, things like that. And that is very strengthening to all the capillaries and veins in the body. So the capillaries in the eyes. For people who have a tendency for hemorrhoids, that's a type of venous, you know, lucid, you know, it's not so tight and toned. Um, spider veins, varicose veins, things like that. Elderberry is really like a food kind of medicine tonic in that way. Because you can use that as a syrup or as a elixir or in a honey base, something like that. You can use it really consistently over a period of time, along with other things to help really strengthen quality of the veins and the capillaries. That's another thing to consider. I think blueberries and elderberries pretty awesome way to do it. Yes. Is the red elder totally toxic or good for anything? No, I think it's totally toxic. From what I know, maybe somebody will tell me differently, but the little bit that I remember is totally toxic. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think else to say about Anybody else have anything you want to add? Rachel or anybody else about elderberries, other flowers, anybody's experience? Well, I know, and Massachusetts, a lot of old farmers always, always had an elderberry by their compost. And that really accelerated the compost. So that's I how have, I got so big. And so I used to always. That's how what? That's how I got so big. But it's right because it's on, it's on the yeah. compost pile. It, it also breaks down compost pile. Yeah, yeah. So, so I used to always grow them. But they love compost, so it's interesting that yours, both of yours, are growing in the compost pile. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Probably the old farmers were making elderberry wine in that. Because you know, elderberry wine was an old way that people actually, you know, made wine. But there was some benefit from the elderberries in the wine. Well, I also want to say. Glad uh, that you both said that. Is that um, there's a beautiful film about a 12th century herbalist. It's, the film is called The Sorceress. Anybody mm -hmm. seen it? Yeah, it's a very beautiful story, and you probably can find it online. 
and it's a true story of a 12th century French herbalist, and her name was Eldamore. And you see a lot going on. You see her gathering different plants um, with the moon and for different situations in the community. But you also see the beginning of the Inquisition, and at that time, and you see the Elder Grove, which was considered to be very, very sacred in Europe. There's lots of fairy tales written about uh, about the fairies and the, and the fairy folk and the elemental beings who live amongst the elder trees. Like you will be in bad disfavor in that world if you dare to cut down an elder tree. Same with the hawthorn. Well, the hawthorn trees and the elder trees are so much European folk tales about them. And I probably have some proof of that. So in the sources, you see her name was Eldamore, but you see um, the, the elder girl being cut down. But there, there is some redemption that's here. <laughs> because of the wise people in that town. But it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful story to watch about the other trees. So, so I'm going to talk about um, Astragalus and Shazander berries. So Astragalus is a Chinese herb, so it's been used for over 5,000 years in China. It grows so well here. Mm. And I would love to see some research going on amongst vegetable farmers who would love to grow a trial of astragalus on their farms because astragalus is in the Lubuminaceae family, which they changed its name to Fabaceae family, but it's in the Lubuminaceae family, so it fixes nitrogen. And traditionally, astragalus grows for a minimum of three years before you dig the root. So it's the root of this plant that's medicinal. So it has incredible benefit to improving the quality of the soil by fixing nitrogen. And it will grow to be about two feet tall or so. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant to grow. It has these yellow pea-like flowers. They're tiny, not like the peas that we eat. And then they produce these beautiful little pea pods. The seed is actually quite good size, not like a camelot seed, as long as you can barely see it. It has a good size seed. seed. And echinacea, I mean, astragalus is very, very easy to start from a seed. It needs to have a little bit of either soaking it overnight. It's a very hard outer seed coat. So either soak it overnight or take a little bit of sandpaper and rough it up that way. And it will germinate within five to seven days. In my loop house, it was the first time I had to deal with um, mice. They love to move along in astragalus with a little delicious little seed. So oh, I just you might cover it with a little reading or something if you have some nibbling friends. But it will grow quite quickly and um, very, very easy to start from seed. I know Petco sells the seeds. I think Johnny sells the seeds. Um, strictly medicinal, it's, a, it's an herb company, medicinal herb seed company out west. So <coughs> once you establish it, if you're interested in growing some, then you can save your own seed. Very, very easy to collect. Very easy to start from seed. And so, um, it is the root, and as I said, after three to four years we dig it. Um, it can, they can grow to be long. If they're happy where they are, they do not want to be planted where the soil is rich in nitrogen. They want to be planted in just kind of plain soil. What is the picture in my book, actually? So don't you have a lot of nitrogen? It's just common sense with that kind of plant. Yeah, I actually wrote about a struggle in here. It's free. It's a great, it's a really, really wonderful plant to consider growing. There's a picture of, a, you can't really see it very well, but there's a picture of Gretchen who used to work with me. We could pass it around if you want. It's a really amazing long root. So, the root of the stragglers is sweet tasting. And most of our sweet tasting roots are really building to the body. So, if you were to be somebody who studies a little bit of Ayurvedic medicine, you're going to have a wonderful, Sally's going to speak here next week. She's a wonderful Ayurvedic um, practitioner. If you're working in any of the traditional systems like Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine, now many, many Western people are also really studying the therapeutic understanding of the flavors. So the flavor of sweet is very nourishing and building to the body. These herbs are used as tonic and tonifying herbs. And the Chinese system of medicine, Stradlis, is considered to be a very important spleen chi tonifying herb and in general just a chi tonic. It really builds the overall energy of the body if you use it over several months. And so astragalus, what's so great about astragalus, and I'm hoping more and more people are gonna are gonna be growing it in Maine, in New England, even farmers as I said, 
be being willing to put in long rows of it um, as part of their rotations because um, it's so it's such a wonderful herb to, to dig up and to chop up and dry and to make into soup stocks. It's one of my most favorite ways to use it because it is so nourishing to the body and so soup stocks, you know, basically you can you can use it um, for those of you who might be making Anyway, all different kinds of soup stocks. Let it decoct it. And the decoction is when you make a tea from roots. You don't just infuse it, you want to simmer it. And, and astragalus can be simmered over several hours, even eight hours. If you wanted to make like a, a strong medicinal soup, like with medicinal mushrooms, like the rishi mushroom. The rishi mushroom. This is an old one, but you know, one of our <laughs> mushrooms here, like the rishi mushroom with astragalus root and other different medicinals, cook it for a long time. And then you could either can it if you were somebody who likes to can it, even small little canning jars, or you could freeze them in ice cubes and then and then put them in your freezer that way and then you can have ice cubes. So what you're making is a really concentrated decoction. And then you have a really medicinal soup stock for the winter time. And it tastes good. I'm thinking about your question. It's a sweet it's a sweet herb. It's not a bitter tasting herb. So um, you can even have fun like putting all kinds of like you can get seaweed and nettles and all kinds of things to make this incredible nourishing soup. But astragalus is very, very important because what it's doing in the body is it's ensuring that through the bone marrow a number of different immune cells that are produced in the bone marrow are being produced in a very healthy way. So this is one that works as a deep, deep immune tonic. Very different than echinacea or elderberry, who work very quickly to mobilize particularly white blood cells in the body. Astragalus is working on a very deep level, so it's not like you just drink a cup once or twice. You're not really going to benefit from it. You need to either be using it as a tea, or using it as a soup stock, or using it as a tincture. I might have got a tincture. Yeah, I did. Anybody, this is an alcohol, but you can certainly take a drop if you want to get a little taste of it. Um, my favorite way is to either make tea or soup, or soup out of it. So astragalus, besides that ability to very deeply build the immune system through the bone marrow, um, it, this is a herb that I recommend for all of us living in tick endemic areas to start using astragalus um, in the winter to really ensure both your immune system is kept healthy through the winter, but particularly as we go into before we go into tick season. Astragalus, um, I really thought about this, and it makes a lot of sense to me, and I thought about it from the way the Chinese talk yeah. about the concept, which I really like. They talk about, they say there's something called Wei Qi. And mm -hmm. Wei Qi is actually, it's almost like the invisible layer on the skin. It's not really the skin. It is our first line of defense. That's what the Wei Qi is. And the way that's why all this ridiculous having people wash their hands and all this horrible, incredible antibacterial soaps, you are ruining the way chi actually is what you're doing. You're ruining the first line of defense. You're doing the complete opposite. We need that way chi to be really healthy in the body. The stragglers really strengthens the way chi. Why that's important for us living in a tick endemic area is because that's our first line of defense. Mm -hmm. So astragalus is both very from within, deeply supporting the immune system at a very deep level, but it's also supporting that first line of defense in the body. I can tell you a story. Many, many years ago, I helped a family who lived on Greens Island. And Greens Island um, is off Final Haven. And they lived uh, completely off the grid, and they, by mistake, left a candle burning in the night, and they burned their house down. And you can imagine on Greens Island, there's nothing, right? And um, the father got the children out, but he had very bad second degree burns in his arms. And I used astragalus with him. And so you think about that for a minute. It made a lot of sense. You know, I was giving him astragalus internally and some other things for the burn, but I also was really trying to heal his you know, that first line of defense. And his skin grew back really, really well. So you can consider. So people won't think about astragalus for burn, you can definitely consider that as one for burn. The other thing about astragalus, because it's sweet, 
sweet tasting root, medicinal roots, um, both have an affinity with the digestive system. So for people who are run down, people with chronic fatigue, people who are convalescing from a long time illness, even for people who have chronic Lyme's or other situations where the body is really run down, give them a stragglus and a soup stock and have them take that very regularly or stragglus and a tea. Because that sweet taste is also building to the digestive system. And building to both the stomach and the spleen. And the spleen is, in the Chinese system, we say that the spleen is what transforms and transports all the nutrients that we eat. So a stragglus is also going to support a good healthy spleen, which is really key for good digestion, which is really key for our overall health and wellness. So a stragglus is a really safe, long-term tonic way for people to be using for good digestion, for good immunity, for good protection. The stragglus also has an affinity with the lungs. So this is a good moment to say that if you're using a tonic herb you, and you come down like a stragglus and you come down with an acute situation like a fever or flu, you would stop using your stragglus as a soup stock or as a tea or as a tincture and you would address those acute symptoms. And then you would go back to using the stragglers to build up your system. So in, so in a situation um, for somebody who is on a long-term cancer treatment, I often will add in the stragglers because the stragglers actually will strengthen the immune system. Even people who are on chemo and radiation, um, the stragglers has traditionally been used um, in a regular way to immobilize the immune system in a way that's appropriate but also um, to really just support the digestive system because a lot of treatments, a lot of antibiotics, people are on antibiotics really weakens the digestive system. So people who may be using um, antibiotics for Lyme disease or long-term chronic situations really want to be working with supporting the digestive system. So stragglers would be one that I would prefer. So fresh ginger tea would be another one I would think about. Um, Anything else I want to tell you? Well, the other thing about um, astragalus, in thinking about this particular, we are in, we're in the height of summer right now. But when you think about the wheel of the year, and I love to think about the wheel of the year because I am so much of a gardener and I live so much in rhythm in the wheel of the year, there are many, many people who have different seasons where they have different health challenges. So there are many, many people who it, as we come into fall, get respiratory infections. And the reason that is, is because what happens What happens in September and October? The weather changes so dramatically. It will be hot, it will be cold, it will be damp. It's very erratic. And what happens in September is the winds change. So you're all aware of that. If you haven't paid attention, pay attention because September and October, from an herbalist perspective, is when I, I treat so many people with who begin to get respiratory troubles because um, their the lungs are a little bit weaker for them and that's the weakened, more vulnerable place in their body. Particularly people who as it gets cold, who don't wear scarves around their necks, who are very perfectly dressed, even for summer heat here. Um, the wind will just go right into the body here, or the back of the neck, or behind the knees or the ankles, um, the kidneys or another vulnerable place for cold wind. So when the weather really changes, besides using your astragalus to keep the immune system strong and the lungs healthy, just think about keeping the scarf wrapped around, keeping the kidneys covered, keeping, you know, warm socks, things like that. That would also be really helpful. So for people who have a tendency to be vulnerable to bronchitis or pneumonia, and that's going to be a real pattern for, for people who really struggle with respiratory things. That's when you really have to start taking astragalus one or two months before that season of when they're most vulnerable. Does that make sense? You don't want to all of a sudden find yourself in a season when you're quickly vulnerable. You want to start supporting that person before that time. So if anybody is in that situation, you can think about that in that way. Um, anybody have a question? Or something you want to share about Australia? Well, yes. just a question about you plan it. And it takes three years. Three to four years before you dig the roots. And, but each year, do you get the, the seeds and the flowers? Yes, okay. and then you can plant more. So if you had a little area you wanted to grow, and you wouldn't need, you know, you could grow maybe, maybe you could grow like 10, 12, 15 plants of, of 
And if they're happy where they are, you'll get some nice roots. Even ten plants you can grow. And then you could chop it up and you know you could have it for tea, dry it for tea or for soup stock. But then you would plant more the following year. Yeah. So you could just that's the same with echinacea. You know, we, we plant every year echinacea, we plant astragalus every year. That makes sense? Yeah. And that's where it's also nice if neighborhoods wanted to have neighborhood garden, a medicinal garden, and grow certain things, or somebody might grow one, somebody might grow another, but you share the bounty of the harvest, that's a nice way to do that too. It's fabulous. Um, it really, it, astragalus, if you're going to tincture, it needs to be cooked. We cook our astragalus for 12 hours before we tincture it. So we make a <coughs> long time concoction of our astragalus, and then we just add the alcohol as a preservative. Um, you know, just talking about tinctures, there's a few things to say. There are many, many herbs that give their medicine to water really well. And then there are some herbs that don't give their medicine to water. For example, bean propolis. Anybody were to be using bean propolis or have a hive and you're scraping the propolis. You try to make a tea for propolis, forget it. It's so high in resins. Resins and water don't mix. So that's where you would either be nibbling and chewing on your propolis and getting like your spruce gum and getting your mouth full of resin, or you would make a tincture. So, so, and then there are, I, this is how I started, you know, when I started Avena 31 years ago, it was just myself in my backyard in a little tiny corner of my house, and I realized this more than 31 years ago, that there was such a need for people to have access to really good quality herbs, and there was very little 31 years ago, there was almost nothing available. And so, as one person, I couldn't grow enough and dry and make enough teas for people. So that's really how I started to make teas for people, because I could grow enough of something and I could make a gallon of something as one person for you know, my neighbor and my community, whereas I couldn't do that for dry herbs. Like, you'll see with the astragalus, you might for yourself, you might just want to grow 15 plants for yourself and your family. You can see how you decide to use that. Yes. Yes. Wait a minute. Um, in the case of um, my, it looks as though you were suggesting the homeopathic preparations for the bite without necessarily knowing whether one is contracted or not. Um, but is there any problem in taking something to try to identify from actually developing? I can just tell you what I do. And it's just my experience. I am out in the garden you know, eight, 12 hours a day. Um, I wear Dickie's white overalls. I wear socks up over my pants. I look ridiculous probably in some people. Um, I keep myself pretty covered. But as far as herbs go, I'll tell you what I do. Um, I I was bitten three years ago and I was in a very, I was very, very stressed. And I, I was sick. I got lungs. And since then I've thought a lot about stress. So I work Really, I work every day to manage my stress levels. I'm not always successful at it, including I visualize myself really protective. Um, I use teaser root tincture. I use three drops every morning. Um, that's another conversation that we can talk about teasel at the end if we want to. Teasel, um, there's many, many uses for teasel, but it's very protective to the body. I also have been using a medicinal mushroom. It does not grow here. It's called Agaricon, and Paul Stamets, who runs a, a certified organic medicinal mushroom farm in the West Coast, he, he makes Agaricon capsules. That's the one time I use capsules. And Agaricon has some strong antispirochetal properties, so I take a capsule a day just as a preventive. And um, I use astragalus. I start using astragalus. I love astragalus tea. Actually, I have a third astragalus in the car for the way home. So I drink a lot of astragalus. Um, I think what else I use? I eat lots of garlic. I eat lots of garlic. <laughs> Things like that. Just keeping myself strong and And keeping a strong visual about a good healthy boundary. And then we do our best, right? Do tick checks. That's all we can do. You know? You can add to that. I, I treat wine only. Integratively around here, and um, I, I do have 
one issue of one of the things you said about astragalus, which is um, in terms of chronic Lyme cases, it actually, that would be, yeah, okay, you had said that. But I say it now, sorry. So preventively, it's very good. When you get a tick bite, you should triple or quadruple the amount of astragalus you're taking. And, um, and then in the early stage, I call it the, the first responder. So it's, it activates the part of the immune system that is the first responder when a spirochete comes into your body. So that needs to be strengthened at the very beginning and strengthened all the time preventively. But after the beginning stage, if you continue to take a stragglers, it will continue to activate the wrong part of the immune system. And you have a danger of going into an autoimmune kind of thing. You're revving up the wrong part of the immune system if the uh, infection continues for very long. And that's true of any, um, as I was saying, any acute infection that don't use a spot. Is not, there's a lot of time where you can stop taking it. Yeah. I like how you describe it, and how I would describe it is that it can drive, it can drive what you're trying to resolve in your deep lake and hide it. And that's true for spagulus and chronic lines. So the other thing in terms of you know what to do with a tick bite, um, now Stephen Buhner, who was sort of like the Lyme guru, he, uh, his latest book is recommending that if you get a tick bite, you take andrographis tincture and put the tincture on the bite, and then you put bentonite clay over that and some kind of cloth bandage to keep it in place for like 12 to 24 hours. And you drastically increase the amount of astragalus you're taking in. And I would also uh, recommend uh, taking a loose road. And Herb Farm is the only one that, that's Siberian ginseng. Her Herb Farm is the only one that I know of that produces these, the eleuthero at the concentration it needs to be at to be effective against the spirochete. Um, I do, we do a double extraction. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. So, herbally, that's... that's eleuthero really is commonly called Siberian ginseng. It's another herb. It's a, it's, a, it's a woody shroud that grows well here. We can grow here in the it's another one that, along with the Shazam, which I'm going to talk about, I really want to encourage people to need this herb growers um, growing a luthero because it's, most of it's coming from not from the U.S. And so it grows really well here. It's the root bark that's being used. I'm really interested to see if actually the bark or the rinds to have any of the same medicine from it. But I think that it's really important and it grows really well here. Yeah. You come to visit us and be able to show you our interest. So it's a, it's one, it's a strong call for people to be growing. Very, very helpful. Um, but for really deeply strengthening the energy of the world. And it's effective against mine. Very, very effective. I use it every day in my life. Yeah. Somebody else has a question. I'm just wondering where a commenter who is talking to you about the infection, but Otherwise, so, so tonic herbs are, this is, you know, we can give kind of general guidelines and then it's going to be to each individual and to the season that you're in, the season of the year and the season of your life and what you're looking for. So tonic herbs, um, like a Luthron, is one that you could take for months and months and months very safe. The same with a stratus root unless, as you're saying, you're in a chronic Lyme situation. Um, I think about Shazana, which I'm going to talk about next, is one that I use long term very safely. So it really depends on what the word is, who the person is, what the situations that you're working with, and what the season is that you're in. Does that make sense? <laughs> so, and then the other thing to say about for me, for me with, with using tonic herbs is that I also am not necessarily going to leave somebody on a formula long term. Meaning, it might be that after three months we evaluate and it, it might be a little bit of a shift, or maybe not. But it's like, you know, sometimes people get left on pharmaceuticals for years and years and years and years and never evaluate it. <coughs> With herbs, you know, it's good that we, that we evaluate what's going on and what it 
is that we're using you know sometimes like I wouldn't like I wouldn't leave somebody on Japanese for months and months and months and months. Um, yeah. um, about a Luthro, uh, it's fine to take it long term, but it you do need to take breaks with it. That's true. They, when you're taking it to treat an infection like a Lyme infection, you take it for sixty days and then you're off for two weeks and then on for sixty days and off for two weeks. If you're taking it long term, just as a tonic kind of thing, I would say you know, on for two weeks, off for a week, or on for four, off for three, you know, something like that. You don't take it continuously every day. Long term. The way that I do, like when you do my in my little drink that I drink every day, like I sometimes what I'll do is go for four or five days and take a break. So you can yeah. just you figure out some kind of rhythm that works for yourself so that the body is. Food, and we don't necessarily eat the same food every day for months and months and months. We're going to have some kind of variation. Let me just finish with Shazandra. Um, the Shazandra berry is also a Chinese herb. It's one of my most favorite, favorite vines to grow. It's called magnolia vine, commonly. And uh, it's beautiful, beautiful. You can see that. Oh. So there are these beautiful red berries, and I've been I've been growing them for about 16 years. And I first I got my first vines from a place in the West Coast called One Green World. And they specialize in northern hardy varieties of medicinal shrubs and trees and, and herbs, and then lots of different types of northern hardy fruits. Now um, we've been propagating our own and. I eat a bunch to Fetco and Fetco trees now with some cuttings. And I can say that we might start to sell them at Amina for seeds. They're very prolific. Once they're very happy with their established, they'll send out runners. So you can easily take root runners and cut them. And what I do when I do that is I, I, um, I'll cut it, obviously. And I, I like to put them in pots. And I like to keep them in the pots for one to two years because the root structure will get really strong and hardy and then plant it out. That's just one way to say that. Um, the best way to grow them, which I didn't know when I first started, is to, to grow them up, but to keep them well pruned. And you'll see if you, if you come to visit us, the first ones I put in 16 years ago, they're incredibly, all the woody vines yeah. all tangled and amazing. They still produce berries. And then they're so prolific really have to prune them. Prune them to grow like grapes. And that's how we're we're about to put another arbor up. And I put in three rows of grape wire and then you really have to prune them and get and train them to grow on the wires. And that way you're gonna get incredible, beautiful red berries. And so the Shazanna berry in Chinese medicine they call it Thai flavored fruit. It's sweet, sour, salty, bitter and it's so interesting that different people come and taste a berry because different people will tell you, oh, that tastes really bitter to me. That tastes so sour to me. Oh, that's so kind of It's so interesting because every one of us is a little bit different. And what the body needs is a little bit different for each of us. But this particular herb, Shazander, is useful for all constitutions of people. It's quite an amazing one in that way. And it's a berry. So it's, you know, it's like a food source, medicine source. And it's truly incredible tonic and you'll see it listed in a lot of herb books as an adaptogen. Like the Luthero, adaptogens are, are herbs that help the body better adapt to different types of stress. And that term actually was coined, the term adaptogen was coined by a Russian professor doing research on a Luthero actually in Russia. They were doing all their research in the 50s on factory, people working in factories. They were trying to figure out what herbs would actually help people working in factories to have better physical stamina and endurance and clearer minds and better memories. That's how that research happens. So there are many, many herbs now that are coined adaptogens. I will tell you from my experience as a herbalist that there are many herbalists that I think dose too high for adaptogens and we end up overstimulating the body. So again, in the question of dosing and how much do we get and how, how long we give, everybody has to Try that out for themselves to see where the appropriate dosage for you. The Shazander, we can pass it around, and it's an alcohol tincture. But I love to put a dropper full in my water bottle. 
which I do almost every day. And it's almost like a squirt of lemon. It has a kind of a fresh kind of taste to it. But the Shizandra is definitely a very, very important action. So again, helping people better not to stress. And I will say that if you were to think of one word that you go away with, for Shizandra, the word is resilience. Mm -hmm. And this, this herb really, really builds resilience from a very, very deep, deep in the place. And the Chinese, in their medicine ways, are much more poetic, I think, than we are in the West. And so they describe Shizandra as a herb. They say that there's a concept in Chinese medicine that the Shen, they describe the Shen, they define it as spirit or consciousness. And that the Shen resides in the heart. Which is a beautiful concept if you really think about that. And Shizandra is known to really help support the spirit of Shem so that, that we live with more steadiness in our heart. And the Chinese say also that Shizandra really supports um, the way that, that we hold on to what's most essential, what's most valuable in our life. And that when we can hold on to what's most essential, valuable in our lives, and we can actually really truly live our life in truth of what we came to live. And that there's a light, a quality of light in one's eyes when we're living the gift that we came in to give to contribute to our planet. So Shazander can really help support a person in that journey to really holding and living into what's most essential. And I use Shazander a lot and I thought about it a lot just in coming here and thinking about Scott and Helen and their political commentary for many, many years. And Shazandra is an herb of our time right now, um, both to study the heart because there's so much that disturbs the heart within the heart. You know, there's so much racism and blatant and outright hatred that's being spoken in our country that's embarrassing, I'm sure, for every one of us in this room. And so the heart gets disturbed by that. The emotional heart is disturbed by what we're dealing with right now in our country and in the world and the loss of so many species every day and the loss of the health of our earth. So Shazander is one to really call upon, even in small drop doses, you don't necessarily even need a lot of it, to really help to bring steadiness to the heart to bring a quality of resilience so that we actually can find our voice and find ourselves to be more upright and steady in ourselves so we can be less reactive and more responsive to how it is that we can contribute in a good way because it's up to all of us what's happening right now and how we can be strong in ourselves. So Shazander is an amazing tonic in that way I think of this time to be able to help each of us stay true in our hearts. The other few things about Shazander, which is interesting, given that we're also being challenged in this time with so much pollution in our planet, Shazander has a little affinity with the liver. And the liver is one of the organs that has to that everything that goes in, that our body is exposed to or that we take in into our body through food, through you know, the pesticides, herbicides people are exposed to, or just all the variety of toxic chemicals people are exposed to, Shizandra is an ally in helping to keep the liver healthy and able to function well and able to release a lot of the, a lot of the toxins that we're exposed to. So though dandelion is a really good one the liver time, I use Shizandra a lot for people who are exposed to different types of toxicity. Um, so even for use for people, Shizandra is considered to be really helpful for people living with hepatitis. B, hepatitis C, I would give Shizandra. You know, we give it to them in that way in tea form or in syrup form, or we can give it to them in a tincture to the liver condition. And it's also very important for the lungs. So that quality of astringent sourness that, that Shizandra has, also for people where there's weakness in the lungs, shortness of breath, and for some people, they say in Chinese medicine, that we hold grief in the lungs. And so, if somebody is in a difficult situation with a lot of grief in their life, that's where I optimally give rose and I give Shazam. Again, it's going to help to bring comfort to the heart, which is really important when grief is happening, and also not to shut down the grief, but somebody can 
feel held well. And that's what Shisandra does. It holds us so that we're not just leaking the emotional difficulty that we're in, but we feel held well. And the heart is steady and we're able to move through the process of grief in a way and come through the other side of that and to feel a sense of resilience and, and strength and to feel well. So Shisandra is an amazing one and such an easy one for people to grow. You just need to grow it, as I said, it needs to grow in black grapes, it needs to grow in some kind of an arbor. And it grows so well here. So I really, really hope that um, if you know your other wonderful partners that are looking to add in some medicinal herbs, I would say Shisandra is one, Astragalus is one, um, both of those would be really, really good to be growing. And, um, I want to just uh, um, read you a couple things and we'll end. Let's see if there's any questions. This is a beautiful quote um, from an Ojibwe herbalist. And this, is a, this is a statement of the, the, the level of racism that we're dealing with is how many Native people go unnamed. You know, we, we have gained so much wisdom from Native people and they go unnamed. So this is an Ojibwe herbalist whose name is not known. And this is an Ojibwe herbalist talking to a plant before the harvesting. And this is a good reminder to say, for us as herbalists, we always recognize that when we are harvesting, there's always an opportunity for us to say thank you before we just take the plant. So this Ojibwe herbalist would say, may your spirit plant and may my spirit together form one spirit of May your spirit plant and my spirit together form one spirit. And that's, I think, a beautiful image for us as we're working with plant medicines to remember that we are also the spirit. And that the medicine plants really remind us, especially in this time, such challenge that we are just so deeply connected to each other. I love that quote. I know that quote. And I'm telling you about quotes. It's fun to see the spirit of hell. <laughs> I offer quote. So, anyway, I'm happy if anybody has any comments or questions or. Yes. Um, you mentioned Shizandra and uh, history of the letters for Dirk Healing. And I wondered whether <coughs> this can be used in uh, oil infusions topically or. Um, written kinds of deep um, pains. I don't. I've never seen anything written about Shazandra being used topically. What, what about comfrey or? Well, comfrey, yes, can be used topically. Comfrey is remarkable for easing all. You know, both a, a comfrey leaf poultice or a comfrey root poultice. Um, or fomentation. So fomentation is you make a strong tea or decoction, you put cloth in it, and you put it off over the area where there's pain. The other thing is, uh, depending where it is in the body, is to do a whole body bath with comfrey. You know, make a strong bath of comfrey leaf or comfrey root, and get right in the bath with it. There's a French, a very famous French herbalist, um, who wrote a book called of Plants, I think it's called of Plants and something, Maurice somebody. He worked only with hand hand and foot baths, that's all he did with herbs. So that would be another example of comfrey, um, you know, to soak one's hands and feet in a, in a nice warm comfrey bath and healing the joints of the body. Solomon seal is a really, the true Solomon seal that's native to us here in, in the northern part of North America, and a lot of people grow true Solomon. Solomon seal is one you can make an oil from, and you can make an oil from comfrey, Dry, I would make it from dried comfrey root and comfrey leaf, and also from dried Solomon seal. But both of those can be made into oils. So besides, you know, baths, you can also rub comfrey root oil and Solomon seal oil onto any kind of joints, tendons, <coughs> muscles, ligaments that are inflamed and are irritated and just hurt. Else, yes. And the Shazandra, how, how long does it take to establish? You know, before you would harvest it. Before you get the berries. I would say my mine took almost eight years. Eight years, yeah. But depends on where you plant them. 
Um, I would plant them in more sun because we're the, we're so far north. You see, in a lot of Chinese books, they say plant it in part shade, part sun. This mm -hmm. far north, I would say plant it in sun. And if you plant it in soil that's fairly, um, you know, well drained and well composted soil, you might get berries in three to four years. Yeah. Plants always. Okay, so that yeah, okay. You could. Yeah. It took me eight years. Like a tree. Get a, What'd you say? It's like a tree. It's After a tree. five years, it'll start. Yeah. So what do you? So what do you? Uh, I mean, it's mean, so what do you buying? Yeah. So you might find that you're lucky. Yeah. They're happy where you put them. But basically, five to eight years. No, I would say you, you would do. I would say maybe after four years, you might get lucky. What will happen though? Is you might begin to get the beginning of the, they're growing clusters. Right. They're beautiful clusters. What has happened for us is that every year more clusters come. So as the plants, as these vines have become more established, um, especially if I were to do more pruning, okay. that they will they will, they will produce over the years. So they'll begin to produce more clusters for you. So have fun with that. Yeah. Yes. So I've been actually propagating um, Shizanga this year for the first time, and I just wanted to ask you, when you layer them into pots and you put them in pots, do they need to protect, be protected in a greenhouse, or just outside they're we, fine we, over winter? We just put them right up against the greenhouse, and some of them I even left on top of a, a table by the greenhouse. Just right outside? Yeah. They're fine? I just put them right outside. Okay. You know, you could, the way that I, I do it, I think, would be to do it outside. If they're very cold hardy. Yeah. Okay. Is to put them up against, you know, some there's some protection for them outside, mm -hmm. southern facing wall. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. what that's what, where they are right okay. now. And then you could also, if you wanted to, you know, mm -hmm. once the once everything freezes, mm -hmm. you could certainly throw a bunch of straw on top. Sure, of them multiple. Like yeah. That. yeah. Okay. But I've had some in pots for like four years. Really, I have one big one. I need to put it in the ground. It's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> um, but I really saw the difference mm -hmm. in the root structure in putting them in pots. Just letting them just develop like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Where are you propagating them from? Um, my partner and I have a, a little homestead we've been working on in Unity, and there's a mature humongous, yes. and mm -hmm. we had. I think they need a male and female. Is that true? Yeah. They've been there for many years, so they're very prolific. So we've been propagating from that. Well, we yeah. need people growing it everywhere. Mm. And lots and lots and lots of Shazandra. I really think it's an herb of this time. So yeah. hopefully you might, I don't know what your plans are, but get it really Bring growing. it over this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Bring it over this way, Richard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yes. Yes. Then our gardens are open. Monday through Friday, 12 to 5, you're welcome to come visit us. And there's a few little pieces of paper because we do herb walks in the garden. I do the herb walk. The next one is July 20th, on Wednesday the 20th, and then the first two Wednesdays in August. They're at 3.30, 3.30 to 4.30. So you're really welcome to come down and tour the garden or go on an herb walk. So thank you all so much. Thank you.